Welcome to Storytime. Thank you for joining me today. Happy Friday wherever you are. And I know some of you way out in Zambia. It is late at night. But thank you for joining in Storytime and welcome. I hope you had yourself a beautiful week, a lovely week indeed with you and your family and all your loved ones. Thank you for joining me. I am glad to be here for another installment of Storytime. And as you know, today we have an amazing guest, somebody that just inspires greatness. Thank you so much for joining us today and I hope you're ready to meet our guest for today, Dr. Zeta Elliott. She will be right here with us so please hold on and get to meet her and also she'll be doing the reading today. So how exciting is that? Thank you so much for joining me today. Please as always let me know where you're joining in from and who is joining in with you. And this has been one of the great things about Storytime and the community, getting to meet all the amazing people, you out there, and of course, the guests that we've been able to have on with us. So thank you so much for joining me, and I hope you are having a lovely week, and I hope after this, you're going to have a lovely rest of your Friday, and of course, a beautiful weekend to come. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm always glad to be here. It is an absolute pleasure and an absolute honor to share time with you all. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me today. Welcome to Storytime and thank you so much for joining me. And um, yes, before we get started, let us see who is joining us today and ready to enjoy a wonderful time with the amazing Zeta Elliott and of course the amazing book that she has for us today. Thank you so much for joining us. And as you know, April is uh, Poetry Month and so of course it was only right that this amazing person comes here and closes it off for us today. Thank you so much for joining in today. Let us see who is with us and ready for our guest. Good morning to you, Terry Kastweka, and of course, Abraham in sunny San Leandro, right close by. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for being here. And it is a little cloudy in Oakland, but still the sun shines. Thank you so much for joining in. All the way out, in Massachusetts, Harvard, Massachusetts. Henry, good morning to you. And of course, Marietta, how are you doing today? Thank you so much for joining in Story Time. I hope you're ready for our day together. Good morning to you as well. Amanda West, Sarah and Nathan joining us out in Illinois, sunny Illinois today. Thank you so much for joining in. And you might want to know that our guest today is in Illinois as well. Thank you so much for joining in story time today as always Sarah and Nathan and of course Amanda West thank you for joining in baby Bia how are you doing today Nate welcome back to story time always good to see you here my brother thank you for being here and of course Amanda Waltman thank you so much for joining in story time baby Bia Amanda and Nate welcome to story time out in Seattle thank you for joining us 
Flynn, how are you doing today with Isla joining us in California? Thank you so much for joining in. Good morning to you and welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Jen Vetter, how are you doing today? Great to see you and say so excited to hear Arthur Zeta Elliott read to us today. Yes, indeed, Jen Vedder. We've been spoiled these last few weeks. Zeta Elliott with us twice. Thank you so much for joining in. Absolutely appreciate you and hopefully see you soon, Jen. All right. And uh, Chriselle joining us with Clay Rojo. And of course, um, hopefully great grandpa June is joining in as well. Thank you so much for joining in. And you say it is a hot one in LBC today. Well, thank you for joining us out in Long Beach, California. Good morning to you. <laughs> Ellen Edwards in Chicago, sunny Chicago, Illinois is enjoying great sun today. Thank you so much for joining in as well. Oh, as always, Ellen, Good to see you. Thank you for being here. And we are back in Oakland. Good morning to you, Soraya, the sticky spider. How are you doing today? And of course, Sharon Lungo, right here in Oakland. Thank you for joining in. Good morning to you. In Florida, Betty Graydon, good morning to you. Thank you so much for being here. Lomani Lee in Sacramento. And of course, Carrie, how are you doing today? Thank you for being here. Good morning. Arthur Mash, Ashley Mulenga, all the way out in Lusaka. Zambia with Lusungu. Thank you so much for joining in story time today. Good morning to you. Leon and Mateo in Oklahoma. Always a pleasure seeing you. Thank you so much for joining in. And of course, we have joining us today as well from Atlanta, Georgia, Calandra. Calandra, please let me know who else is joining in with you on story time without much ado today is a special day. We have a special guest coming on to join us today. And, um, We'll get back to look at who else is with us today. But for now, the amazing Zeta Elliott is here with us today. Please join me in welcoming her. <laughs> How are you doing, Zeta? <laughs> Hi, Mr. Lamada. I'm good. I wish I had as much energy as you. Boy, it's contagious. I can feel my energy. <laughs> so thank you for such a warm welcome and for inviting me here to read my book. Oh, such a pleasure. No, thank you for taking the time to be here with us. So and it's great to see that there are folks from Illinois. Hey, <laughs> I'm in Evanston, so I'm not too far from Chicago. And it is a beautiful day. I was out for a walk earlier, and I absolutely know I'm going to be writing a little later on because being oh, outside yeah. in the sunshine with the flowers, and yeah. yeah, it's definitely inspiring. Yeah. Well, I know you have a great story lined up for us. And I'm, I was going to say, who is Zeta Elliott? But I know that there's some of your story will be shared today yeah. <laughs> so we'll leave that and then we'll come back together later on and maybe have a little chat but for now all yours please take us away <laughs> that's great thank you so much so the book that i'm going to read today is called roots run deep and it is a book that i self-published late last year i think it was december 31st of 2020 uh, and I was really happy to get the book out, but it is my pandemic book. <laughs> I started it in 2019 and then the pandemic started and you know, we've all had to make a lot of adjustments. Uh, and my illustrator was having some difficulties. So I had to find another illustrator and I was living in central Pennsylvania. And so in my presentation today, I'm going to show you some of my family photographs because when I talk about roots, I'm talking about a few things. So I twisted my hair this morning. So there are the roots on my head and my roots always remind me that I am a woman of African descent. If I go way back and find my ancestors, that's where they're from, West Africa. And then I also think about the fact that I'm an immigrant, just like Mr. Lamada. I am an immigrant. You might hear my accent as I'm reading when I say things like out or about. I am Canadian. I was born and raised just outside of Toronto, but then I moved. I followed my father and he's an immigrant too from the Caribbean. So he went from the Caribbean, a country called Nevis, a very small island, he went from Nevis to Canada, and then he went back to the United States for high school and college, and then he went back to Canada, and then he went back to the United States. I come from people who move around a lot, and I move around a lot too. But I don't know if you can see kind of over my shoulder. I always have bookshelves in my home, 
shelves that hold photographs of my ancestors. And most of those photographs are black and white because they were taken a long time ago. And I thought it might be interesting to share with you some of my family photos that come from my family tree. And of course, a tree grows from the roots up. So that's another way to think about roots. And you know, when I was little, probably like six years old, my dad ran a summer camp. He ran a summer camp for kids to teach us about our African ancestry. And I remember that we made masks, paper mache masks, which was really fun. But my dad also made us watch a show called Roots. And it was a show that talked about how Africans were enslaved and brought to the United States and they weren't treated very well. And we were watching one scene where a man was being whipped and I didn't wanna see that. And so I left the room and I was working on my paper mache mask and my dad came right outside <laughs> and grabbed me and pulled me back in the room and said, you have to watch this. And as an adult, I understood why he did that. But you know, even though my grandmother talked about slavery, she used words like Negro, and I didn't always understand what she was saying. So while I was living in central Pennsylvania, I thought to myself, you know, what could I do to help kids understand how Africans came to be in America? And I thought, well, I could write a book. And so I did called Roots Run Deep. So let me just share my screen, hoping I can do this successfully. We did practice, so <laughs> fingers <laughs> crossed. All right, here we go. All right. So my presentation, Roots Run Deep, honoring our ancestors finding ourselves. I learned so much about myself when I look into the past because I'm the product of all the people that came before me and so are you. So here's the first picture. That's me when I was a baby, my mom's holding me. I remember that my grandma knit me that little sweater. Actually, she knit it for my big sister and then it got passed down to me, but I still loved it. And on the other side, that's my family. That's my mom and dad. That's my big sister, my big brother and the baseball cap. And there's me, I'm the littlest one. Now, something that's interesting about my family is that my brother is adopted. And he came up from the Caribbean too, because he is also my father's cousin. <laughs> so technically my brother was my cousin and my brother. Now, that means if my brother were to do his family tree and to trace where he comes from, he might actually need two trees, but they're connected at the roots. So a lot of people have their own special kind of family. There isn't just one kind of family. And whenever I'm writing books, I always try to make sure I represent lots of different kinds of families. Because when I was little, I only read books that had one kind of family. And my family didn't match that kind. After a while, when I was eight, my parents got divorced. And then my dad remarried and had some more kids. So then I had another kind of family. Then he got divorced and remarried again. <laughs> so I had some step siblings. So I have a pretty big, funky kind of family. And I love it. I hope you love your family, too. Here's a picture of my parents on the day they got married. Way back in 1967. George Hood and Francis Hobbs. Now, here's my dad when he was a teenager. That's when he just came up from the Caribbean and he was in Canada. Now, that picture in the middle, that's my dad's dad. So that's my grandpa. But that's my dad's stepmother. Now, you can see there's kind of like a blank face on the other side. That represents my dad's mother. Her name was... Zeta Elliot. <laughs> I am named after my father's mother. My name is also Zeta Elliot, but I don't have a photograph of her. I wish I did. I don't know what she looked like. And she died when my father was a teenager. So we don't really have anything left of her except my name. And I'm glad that I have her name because every time someone says my name or reads one of my books, I feel like it kind of keeps my grandmother alive. Now, I don't have a picture of my grandmother, but I have a picture of her father. That's my father's mother's 
father, <laughs> my great grandfather, Denny Elliott. It's not a very good picture because his eyes are closed, but it's the only picture I have of him. And then here's a picture of my father's mother's mother. So that's my dad's grandmother or my great grandmother, Eliza Hanley. Now these pictures were taken in Nevis. Like I said, that's in the Caribbean. You can probably tell from looking at the picture of the house, my dad didn't grow up with a whole lot of money. He grew up in that house. His mother grew up in that house. And I still have relatives who live in that house. Do you see how it's on rocks? That means that we can pick it up and move it when we need to. So where the house was there, they didn't own the land, only the house. So when the person who owned the land said, I need you to move, they picked the house up and moved it. Now, this is a picture of my father's father's father. <laughs> That's my great grandfather. His name was Joseph Samuel Hood. Now, on the other side of my tree, this is my mother's branch. So that's my mom when she was just out of high school, just before she became a teacher. And these are her parents, my grandparents, Frank Hobbs and Florence Allen. I want you to remember that name, Allen. And here's my grandma again, Florence Avril Allen. She's pretty stylish, right? I love that little dress that she has on with the fedora. My grandma was a preacher in the Pilgrim Holiness Church. That's how she met my grandpa. He was a preacher too. Now, if you looked at these pictures of my grandma, would you say she was white or black? Hmm. Sometimes we think we know a person's race just by looking at their skin color or their hair texture. Well, my grandma was black. She was what used to be called a quadroon, that's one quarter black. Now she never used the word black. She used the word Negro or colored. And those are words that we use to talk about African-Americans a long time ago. We don't use those words anymore because a lot of people find them offensive, but those were the words that she used. And this is a picture of my grandma's father. My mother's mother's parents, my great grandparents, Richard Allen and Laura Holman. Now, Laura Holman was white, but my great grandpa, Richard Allen, was not. He was also a Negro. He was what used to be called a mulatto, which meant he had one black parent and one white parent. And you can tell, look at his hair. So his name was Richard Allen, and he was named after someone else called Richard Allen. But my great grandpa told his children, don't tell anyone that we are Negroes. Just don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. We're going to be good neighbors and good citizens and we're going to get along with everybody, but we're not going to talk about our roots. Now, my grandma thought that was not a good idea. So she talked about her roots all the time, which is how I know about him. Now this is my grandmother's grandmother, Richard Allen's mother, my great, great grandmother. Her name is Ellen Gowland. Now she married James Henry Allen. He was a black man. He came from Philadelphia with his father, John Allen and his brothers and sisters and his mother. And they settled just outside of Toronto. And when James Henry Allen married Ellen Gowland, her family was so upset that she was marrying a black man that they moved away and they changed their last name from Gowland to Golden so that nobody would know they were related to her. It's a terrible thing to do, but they were racist and they didn't wanna have a black person in their family. And then guess what? This is the saddest part. My great, great grandfather, James Henry Allen, refused to have his picture taken because he thought his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren might be ashamed of him because he was a black man. I would never be ashamed of him. I would have been so proud to have a picture of him, but I only have a picture of my great-great-grandmother. Now, I remember I told you the name Alan was important. Well, my grandma told me that our family 
is descended from Bishop Richard Allen. That's a picture of him on the left-hand side. He is the founder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. There's a big church there called Mother Bethel. And this is a picture of his wife, Sarah Bass. So she became Sarah Allen when she married him. So my grandma figures that we are descended from the brother of the bishop, Bishop Allen. And the names keep cropping up in our family, just like I'm named after my grandma, Zeta Elliott. Well, my grandma's father was named Richard Allen. His sister was named Sarah Allen. My grandma named her sons Richard and Allen. <laughs> so the names keep coming up again and again. It's sort of how we honor our ancestors. We keep them alive by keeping their names alive. And then I moved to Philadelphia because I wanted to learn more about my ancestors. And I lived in West Philly and this mural went up not too far from where I lived and it's of Bishop Richard Allen. So the stories that we hear over and over in our families, they shape us. They leave a mark, an impression on our imagination. And that has certainly impacted the kinds of stories that I choose to tell now. I also had my DNA tested. I really wanted to know what part of Africa my ancestors came from. And you know, we can't know exactly where because many people, black people in the United States are the descendants of Africans who were enslaved. They were kidnapped and brought to the Americas. They didn't choose to come like immigrants do. I chose to live here in the United States. My dad chose to live here but our African ancestors had no choice. So when I look at this DNA test, I had to spit into a tube and send it away. And then they studied my DNA. And it says that 32% of my ancestry is from Nigeria. I also have Ivory Coast and Ghana ancestors, Benin and Togo, Cameroon, Congo, and Western Bantu. And then I have some folks from Europe too, from my mom's side. So. I have been to four countries in Africa and I hope to get to go to many, many more since there are more than 50, but I'll probably never know exactly who my ancestors were. If you would like to make your own family tree, you can get a free graphic just like that one at familytreemagazine.com. And you start at the bottom with your name and then your parents' names and then your grandparents' names and then your great-grandparents' names. Sometimes you're gonna hit a blank, just like I did. I don't have a picture of my grandma, right? Even though I know her name, but it's fun to kind of write it down and keep track of where your family comes from. And then that helps you know where you're going. All right, we're ready to read the book, Roots Run Deep. I wrote it, I'm the author. I have two illustrators, Doris Pollard. She's a black woman who lives in Florida. This was her first picture book. And then Gracie Berry, did the beautiful cover and another picture at the back that I'll get to show you too. I'm gonna to start with a land acknowledgement. I wrote this story while living in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I would like to acknowledge that Pennsylvania is the ancestral territory of the Conestoga, Erie, Iroquois, Lenape, Muncie, Nanticoke, Shawnee, and Susquehannock. American Indians were the first to be enslaved by European settlers. Africans brought to the Americas were stolen people on stolen land. I urge readers to support the work of the Circle Legacy Center and other native led organizations. I also recommend reading the graphic novel, Ghost River, The Fall and Rise of the Conestoga by Lee Francis IV. We are African. We are Mende, Asante, Bambara. We grow rice, yams, and indigo. We smelt iron and sculpt bronze. We are scholars and warriors. We tell tales of wily Anansi. Our people are ancient. Our roots run deep. We are African. We are Hausa, Mandinka, and Akan. The white men call all of us Negro because our skin is black. 
They come to our shores in ships. They bring guns to trade with our enemies. Wars rage across the land. Captives are sold into slavery. Our people are put in chains. Now, if you were living in Africa in say the 1500s or the 1600s, you belong to a tribe or a nation like the Hausa or Mandinka or Akan. And so you didn't look at every other black person and think, hey, you're my brother, you're my sister. No, you only looked at people within your tribe or nation in that way. So if you were fighting against another nation and you lost the battle, they might sell you into slavery. We are packed in the belly of the ship. We weep and pray and scheme as we rock upon the endless sea. Some of our people choose death. And you can see someone is jumping overboard in the picture. Others fight to survive. You can see someone fighting on deck. We speak Igbo, Yoruba, and Fula. We are African. We are heading to the Americas. You know, some people chose to jump overboard and some people were thrown overboard if they were sick. And so sharks often swam behind slave ships because they knew they could find things to eat. This is not our land. This is not their land. We are African. To speak to one another, we must learn the enslaver's tongue. They try to take our names, our gods, and our drums, but we do not forget who we are. We grow rice, yams, and indigo. We grow cotton, tobacco, and cane. We dig mines. We smelt iron, we fell trees, we lay roads, we build their homes, we cook their food, we wash their clothes, we raise their children, we work and work and work. And of course, people who were enslaved were never paid for all the work that they did. We are weary, but still, we sing. They are brutal with the lash, but we are gentle with each other. We tend our own gardens. We hunt and fish so that our loved ones eat more than crumbs from their table. We weave baskets from river reeds and turn scraps of cloth into colorful quilts. Our children laugh at tales of cunning brer rabbit we see the beauty within ourselves, even if they do not. We yearn for peace, but it is in the rumbling thunder that we hear God's voice. When the water is troubled, our soul, <clears throat> excuse me, our souls are stirred. We are determined to be free. Darkness blankets us as we steal away to freedom. We feel tree trunks from moss and follow the North Star. We wade through murky swamps. We run from howling dogs. Moses leads us out of bondage. Conductors guide us to safe houses. We risk everything to be free. Now, you may have heard of Moses from the Bible, but Moses in the United States is another name for Harriet Tubman. That's her there with her pistol in the picture. In the North, we are fugitives, no longer enslaved, but not fully free. Many do not welcome us. Some hate slavery, but have no love for us. Others cry, go back to Africa. We are African, but we are also American. We built this country, we will not go. 
we will plant our own fields and build our own homes and raise our own children here. You might recognize the man in the middle of that illustration. Do you know who that is? All that big, beautiful hair, Frederick Douglass. He was an abolitionist. He fought to end slavery. Some Christians open their doors to us, but then make us sit at the back of the church. We know God has a plan for us. We want to have our own place of worship, but it takes time to buy the land. The charter makes our church official. A-M-E, African Methodist Episcopal, Bethel, House of God. Before our bellies were often empty, we hungered for knowledge too, but it was denied. Now we feed our bodies and our minds. We build a school beside the church. Our children study hard and make us proud. You might not know, but during the time of slavery, it was against the law for a slave to learn how to read or write and it was against the law for anyone to teach them how to read or write. Freedom seekers keep coming. We welcome them when others do not. We give them food and clothes. We shelter those who wish to stay and guide those who will journey on. Because of the fugitive slave law, people who escaped from slavery and made it to the North, sometimes they weren't safe. Slave catchers would come and take them back into slavery in the South. So some of them stayed in places like Pennsylvania or New York, but some of them kept going North right up to Canada. Then the war begins. The North fights the South to end slavery. We are African. We are warriors. We fight for the right to defend our country. We fight to set our people free. These are United States uh, colored troop soldiers. And in Lancaster, you can find the graves of some of these soldiers in the graveyard, the cemetery of the AME Church in Lancaster and in lots of other places around the country. The war is over, but we are still fighting to prove that we belong. We are African American. We are citizens. Our men now have the right to vote, but they do not respect our rights. They burn down our church and our school. We rebuild and keep moving forward. Now the 15th amendment only gave black men the right to vote. We had to wait quite a bit longer until black women got the right to vote too. We organize, we march for jobs. They send us bomb threats, but we will not back down. Our youth deserve a future that is better than the past. Now we have lots of rallies and protests going on now, especially this past year, and people march and they hold up signs, right? Now the signs might say, Black Lives Matter. We have come so far as a people, but we still have a long way to go. Our faith sustains us. Our people are ancient. Our roots run deep. And this illustration is for the YWCA Race Against Racism, which happens every year in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I'm really happy that the YWCA is giving out copies of Roots Run Deep to anyone who registers for the race. And there's still time to do that. And it's virtual, so you don't have to be in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And then I wrote a note talking a little bit about my family. And there's another picture that Gracie made, which is beautiful. She made used cowrie shells to outline the shape of the continent of Africa. And inside she put all the women from the AME church who have made contributions to life in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And that is the end of my story. So I'm gonna stop sharing. 
And I think maybe we have a couple of minutes for questions. You can let me know, Mr. LaMada. No. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much, Zeta. That was just powerful. Um, you know, before we open up the questions to everybody else there, and I know I see already some coming in, but I just had a, like, what gives you the courage, that strength to put out your story in its authenticity, you know, like, because not everybody has a story, but how they put it out there depends on so much, but yours just feels like it's courageous. It feels powerful. It feels strong. How do you do that? Wow. Well, thank you for that. I absolutely agree. Everyone has a story to tell. Every single person has a story to tell. And I think doing your family tree can be step one in learning more about your own story. I think, you know, I, I literally have my ancestors like looking over my shoulder <laughs> every single day. Uh, yeah. And everywhere I have lived, I have always had these photographs. Uh, and then, you know, people in my family send me more photographs. I feel really honored that they trust me with them. Um, and I just feel like, you know, my ancestors, they are my flesh and blood. They are my bone, my hair, my DNA. Um, I owe them something, you know. Uh, I grew up in a really devout Christian family, so many preachers and teachers in my family. Uh, but there's always that that verse that I remember from the Bible that says, you were not your own, you were bought with a price. Yeah. You were bought with a price. And I don't mean on the auction block, you know, as a slave, I mean that my ancestors paid a price and sacrificed in order for me to be here. Um, and I think a lot about my grandmother and how her father, you know, said mm -hmm. to her, don't tell. Right? right, like let's keep this quiet yeah. <laughs> and keep this quiet, and we keep marrying other white people. We're gonna like wipe out all traces mm -hmm. of our African ancestry, and then sort of like there's this fluke where my mother <laughs> marries a man from the Caribbean, and then it starts all over again. And now mm -hmm. we have, you know, just a few people in the family who are visibly black. Um, and I just feel like I have a responsibility to my ancestors, to that you know James Henry Allen who thought he shouldn't have his photograph taken. I just mm -hmm. I can't even imagine that. Yeah. And he was right, right? Because then he get, you know, his grandson was, you know, let's not talk about our, our ancestry. Yeah. So I don't really see it as courage necessarily. I think it's a duty. I think I have a responsibility to talk about my family's history. Uh, and I think if it encourages other people to look into their family history, mm -hmm. you know, there are a lot of silences and secrets in every family. My father, you know, didn't want me to talk about his mother. Uh, and, you know, she had a complicated history. She died in a mental asylum. Um, but, you know, not talking about things like mental illness, that doesn't help anybody. It's better to talk about it because when you do, then you have the chance to share your experience and build community with others. Yeah, no, that's amazing. No, talk of inspiring. I'm I'm inspired. And every time I look at the work, it's just amazing. And to listen to it today just adds that extra layer to it. It's just like, Am I doing my part? How can I play my part? But absolutely wonderful. Um, and just also you mentioned in the book, you mentioned wishing that the future is better than the past. You know, what are some things that you think could be done or that are happening now? Do you do you have what's what's your, what do you have hope in our future? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, there are some days I do not feel particularly hopeful, mm -hmm. but I uh, discovered an activist called Mariam Kaba. I think her family's from Guinea. And she said, hope is a discipline, right? It's not something that just magically pops into your head <laughs> or your heart. You know, you have to work at being yeah. hopeful. You have to look for hope. Every single day you have to decide, I am going to make things different. And I may not be able to make things better, but I can at least make things different than they are right now. Uh, so I think, you know, I mean, what you're doing, the fact that you curate this amazing collection of stories that maybe people wouldn't see otherwise, right? Because particular stories are preferred by a lot of people and they get read over and over and over again. And then, you know, stories like mine and so many other writers of color, they just end up being marginalized or not even heard at all. And then the books go out of print. So what you're doing is activism. Uh, what I'm doing is a kind of activism. Um, I, I see our work as an act of resistance, right? So if somebody is trying to rub you out of existence with their eraser or they're trying to shush you and silence you, then we're standing up and saying, we will, we will not be erased and we will not be silenced. And every time we do that, 
we embody possibility for other people, especially for kids, right? Especially for kids. It took so long for me to uproot some of the really problematic things I read as a child that, you know, represented black people in negative ways, lots of racist mm. stereotypes, mm. books from England, <laughs> because yeah. we both grew up in former British, not former <laughs> British colonies. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of work to do um, to understand where your roots are from and how things have taken root that harm you. And so I think we're doing that work to hopefully prevent kids from having to go through that same experience. Yeah, no, wonderful. And uh, I know you mentioned too um, the, that women, were, even though the 15th Amendment was passed, it was only for the black men. Mm -hmm. but women's rights vote came later on. And then just, you know, in uh, you've been referred to as a feminist in most, most literature I've, I've seen. And so what, what, where are where where do you think we're headed? Are we making progress in the feminist feminist movement? And what can people like me do? You know, like what can we all do? Oh, that's a great question. So I really I, I get a little frustrated because I think when I say I'm a black feminist, people think, oh, um, you know, that's sort of like a special club mm -hmm. <laughs> for black women. And we certainly do support one another, but feminism is for everybody. Mm -hmm. Feminism is for everybody. And the amazing thing that Frederick Douglass said, you know, in his slave narrative was he talked about the fact that slavery was just as harmful to the enslaver as it was to the enslaved. It damaged white people as much as it damaged black people and patriarchy, right? This idea that men have to be dominant and aggressive and women should be subordinate and dependent yeah. that damages men as much as it damages women. Mm -hmm. And then men hurt other men and they hurt kids and they hurt themselves. And I just feel like if we want healing for our whole community, our whole society, then we have to uh, embrace ideas of equality and justice. Uh, and I, for me, that's what feminism is. It's about mm -hmm. saying, I believe in the value of all of humanity. I believe in the worth of all human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, I want an end to dominance. I want men and boys and everybody of every gender to be able to express themselves fully and authentically. Um, and so, you know, I think black women do so much work. You know, there's a folk saying that black women are the mules of the world and we do carry so many burdens, not just for ourselves, but for other people. And if we could have someone come along, black men, white women, everybody, if you could help us carry this burden so we don't always have to do it ourselves, that would that would move all of us much farther ahead as a society. Yeah, no, that's so, it's so beautiful. And it just reminds me of, I was watching a show just this past, this week, I think it might have been on Tuesday. And one of the things was mentioned to how certain groups and especially black women may have been brought up in a way that people won't ask for help even when they need it. Cause you're always the one that is carrying <laughs> yes. the, the Lord of the world. And so, yeah, it was just yeah. so interesting for me to see that. And then um, uh, Jean there mentions, you know, um, they mention, I uh, say, yes. And this is part of all of, all of our history. Exactly. Exactly. It's not just something you say for February, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or whatever month you get assigned. Uh, this is American history. This is U.S. history. This is, it's transnational, right? I mean, our roots extend across the Atlantic into so many different places. I have uh, an experimental memoir, family memoir that I'm trying to write called The Hummingbird's Tongue, mm -hmm. because I'm so interested in that idea of hummingbirds as migrants and the idea that, you know, they cross these vast uh, distances and bodies of water. Um, and they find nourishment wherever they are. And I think, yeah, the more we talk about how connected our world is, uh, the less inclined we are to think about uh, or to to invest in things like borders and walls and keeping people out because that that just isn't, I don't think, the way forward. I smile because I hear a bot and... <laughs> boot in a boot. <laughs> It stands out. All right. Five years, it's still there. <laughs> and there, Chrissy as well just says thank you so much for this beautiful storytelling and honest words, and for sharing your family and ancestry with us, Seda. Oh, thank you. Thanks to everyone for tuning in and listening. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and then Jen, but and I, you know, like that word there that Chrissy uses, honest, honest words, because you, you've. 
you feel that authenticity, you feel that story coming from your heart. And I think that's what everybody's appreciating right now. And then Jen Vetter too says, yes, it's better to talk about it. Thank you for sharing your inspiring words and story. Thank you. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, no, so uh, Flynn there saying thank you for the wonderful presentation and sharing with us. And I think many of us, all of us tuning in really like, appreciate that and people are appreciating to family tree and the book such a powerful book and of course too like zeta elliott has many many books and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> please please do um do um find find zeta at um at the website here zeta elliott Dot com. So please do go there and see all the amazing books that are available. And then uh, there was somebody, Jen Vetter, I think also did put up the link to the, the, yes, it's in the chat if you want to register for that. I'm definitely going to register for it. Oh, um, great. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and then Ellen also just appreciating you, your fellow Illinoisan. I don't know if that's how you hey. say it. <laughs> 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 it says yes, powerful way to, you know, just the way to describe the book. I absolutely agree. And then um Harmony Beth welcoming you to the storytime community and just appreciating, you know, like just the the voice you bring. Such a powerful voice. Um and yeah, some more from Jane too. And then uh somebody was asking, and I know you shared it on your um uh in your presentation, I think Betty Graydon had a specific comment on uh, what's the website for the free family tree template. So family tree magazine.com. Okay. Emily. Put in there. Are you doing that? Okay. Oh, you can go ahead. Yeah, no, you have it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I mean, there are all kinds of them, but that was one that I found that I thought was really easy to use. Some of them get pretty complicated and mm. some of us, have families that need complicated templates, but uh, yeah, you, know, you could also the kids could draw one. You know, yeah, if you didn't want to download it. The kids could easily just draw one. Yeah, draw one. yeah no, absolutely. And then uh, Chriselle there in Long Beach, um, also lineage of immigrants, and she's saying, "I love that you know so much about your ancestors," which is so powerful because I and this could be I don't know how it is for you, but sometimes I feel like. For me, coming from Zambia, knowing my family, or at least thinking I know, sometimes I take it for granted, I think I know. And so I end up just knowing the immediate family. Oh, this is my mom's brother. This is my mom's sister. And, and it ends there. I don't go deeper into that. But then you see the value that you're bringing to going deeper and looking into those ancestors and who knows where others ended up. So... Yeah, and you know, sometimes it's not encouraged. My father didn't appreciate me asking mm. questions about his mother. Uh, and he had, you know, I think quite a bit of shame around growing up so poor mm. in the Caribbean. But my grandmothers, even my step grandmother, his stepmother, loved to tell stories. So I, you know, have been very close to my grandparents and the elders in my family. And it's a really a gift when they sit down and and are willing to to share stories. And you can do an oral history in your family, mm. you know, just turn on your voice recorder on your phone and make sure you have their voice telling that story because that's something you can archive and save and pass down to the next generation. The next generation. Wow, that's just amazing. And you know, um I appreciate so much your time, your energy, your being in this space today feels special. It has just felt different. It's something special that you've brought to it. And I'm pretty sure everybody out there has felt it. And um, please, if you, you want this to carry on, look up Zeta Elliott's work and see how you can support, how you can learn from it. We're learning together. We learn every day. The day you stop feeling like you need to learn something is the day that I think, you know, like we need to really evaluate ourselves and our values because we are always learning. We're in a constant, um, constant learning. And so we need to always be looking at others in our communities and also looking to ourselves and remembering too that those little things that we do that we may feel at times don't matter, that those are the things that are super important. And um, yeah, I just want to appreciate that. Want to appreciate you, Zeta, for being here with us today. And um, this has been story time for today. As you can see, I am just 
feeling it right in my heart. Thank you so much for sharing. And to everybody that was joining me in today, thank you so much. I wish you a beautiful weekend, a lovely, lovely weekend, you and your loved ones and your community. Please, please do remember to play that part. No matter how small it feels, it is absolutely important. Hugs and love to each and every one of you. Have a beautiful weekend. Join me next week for more story time when we are back with more amazing stories and many more to come. Thank you so much. Much love from me and bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Take care. Goodbye. <laughs> Stories. Read me all of the stories, some stories from far away, others right here in my neighborhood. Story time. Story time. Story time with Mr. Lamada. He will be starting soon. Just can't wait to be